This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This week in Parasitism, episode number 48, recorded on December 14th, 2012. Hi everyone, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is Dixon de Palmier. Hello, Vincent. D- Dixon, your, your wire is hitting your microphone. I'm... Just undo your arms. Oh, for God's sake. Don't be uh, hostile. All right, how's that? You know, the folded arm indicates hostility. Does it now? Yeah, so why are you hostile? I'm just being relaxed. How you been, Dixon? I've been well, thank you. you no, sure? well, actually, I had a cold. And I'm getting over it, but I think... a cold I'm, for two weeks. I think it's finished. Which is before our last... Uh, after our last podcast. This is very all true, right. very true. And this is TWIP, don't get them confused. No, I won't get them confused. Now, sitting next to you... Yes. ...is a guest. Yes. And uh, I see him all the time around That's right, here. that's right. <laughs> In fact... You, well, let's tell you his name first. Yes. Yosef Sabo, right? Yep, yeah, that's true. And uh, Yossi for short. Yossi. Yeah. Yossi. And what is your position? I'm a postdoc here. With the Steve Goff? Yep, right? at Steve Goff Lab. Uh-huh. Where are you from? Originally, yep. Israel. Born in Israel? Yep. And you got a PhD in Israel, too? Mm-hmm. And came here to do a postdoc? Yep. Wow. <laughs> virology. Retrovirology. Right, uh, but your PhD was in virology also? My PhD was in virology as well. It's in the wrong podcast. <laughs> Don't look at me. I just walked in the door. Well, we have a mutual interest now. <laughs> What's we your do. mutual interest? Um, well, a spe- we specific doing. molecules that we're going to discuss. Oh, okay. That's right. Uh, what are you working on with, with the Goff Lab? Um, retroviruses, retroviruses, HIV, MLV. Yep. What aspect? Assembly? Assembly. Are you a cell biologist at heart? Um, virology. My PhD was on other type of viruses, respiratory, respiratory viruses. But uh-huh. which, one, which one? HMPV, the human metanumovirus. The metanumos, okay, nice. Do you like Boca viruses too? Have you heard of those? A bit. It doesn't mean mouth. <laughs> Boca is a Spanish Yeah, I know yeah. it means but it's not. <laughs> it doesn't mean mouth. No, but these are uh, viruses in, in many people, and uh, whether or not they cause disease or. Right. Yeah, exactly. nobody. The metanumos. Uh, I bet you had a metanumo. I'm sure I did. Right. I think everyone had a metanumo at least until the age of five. That's Actually, what, yeah. that's what they I say. never met a pneumo I didn't like. Nice. <laughs> Let's make the title of the episode. That's probably from Will Rogers that said that. Now you you picked two. Anyway, welcome to Twip. Thank yes. You. Hope you enjoy it. Um, he can, he's going to give us color commentary. <laughs> no, actually, we might be collaborating on this project together, cool. so that's the reason why Dixon, he's here. you picked the papers we're going to do today. I did. I picked two papers, um, but I picked the topic first because the topic that we're going to discuss today is immunity to schistosomes. you got to remind us the schistosome. I'm going to. Shtick. I'm going so, to. You know, the executive summary. Yeah. Okay? It's a parasite found throughout the tropical world. There are three major species, Schistosoma mansoni, Schistosoma hematobium, and Schistosoma japonicum. There's a new one, Schistosoma racanellium. Right. And then there's a fourth one found in the Mekong Delta called Schistosoma mekongai, which is a a variant of Schistosoma japonicum, but it's different, so it's still Mm -hmm. distinct. They're all snail-born for their intermediate hosts. All the snails are aquatic in their habitats. And the adult worms live in blood. They live in the blood supply. So the the real secret to this parasite is how it avoids being killed for 20 to 30 years while it lives in your blood and eats your blood. We talked about him on TWIP. We did. 26. We did. And uh, yes, we did the life cycle. We did that. Let's see if I could bring that up here. We got, actually, in your book, you have a life cycle for each of the three, Mansoni, Japonicum, and Hematobium. Did you know that? I don't know if you know. I I don't know if you know what you have. (laughs) Here's Mansoni. No, I'm not. I haven't become that. uh, 
I guess, plaque ridden in my brain to have forgotten said? everything I ever did. I think you have. No, no, you don't. Anyway, these are, you're infected by Sarcaria? You are. And uh, where do they go when they infect you? Why don't you ask Yossi? Yossi do you know was, this? Do you Yossi know the life knows, cycle? He knows a little bit about this now. I think I will give the expert. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's my first trip. I'm still shy. Yeah, okay. yeah. So the Sicaria penetrates the hair follicle. And, and then skin, it gets so you, it gets on your skin. Yeah, but it doesn't. It can't go through skin. It has to yeah, go through the hair, hair follicle, follicle yeah. right? Gets to the base of the hair follicle. It has discarded its tail. It's now known as a schistosomula. Right. And the schistosomula then secretes uh, cathepsins and uh, metalloproteases, which allows it to gain entrance into your blood supply. And eventually, they're mm -hmm. carried to the lung fields. Actually, they stay in your skin for a little while. Okay, they yeah. stay there for a little while, maybe a day or two. And then they, they acclimate to the 37-degree temperature that your body is because they just came out of cold water mm -hmm. compared to your body. Snails, right? Or the water. No, there's a carrier. We're swimming in the water, and that's but how they found you. snail is an intermediate host? It is. Okay. In the water. So, okay, so now you have this parasite sitting in your skin for a couple of days. Right. And then it gets into the blood supply, and it's carried to the lungs. Once it goes to the lungs, it gets very complicated, but something magical happens at that point. Mm -hmm. It loses all of its ability to be attacked by your immune system. That is to say, it cloaks itself. And it, 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 Is this a fact or are you speculating? No, no, it's a fact. It's absolutely a fact. You can mm -hmm. immunize against the stage that penetrates. And if you stop it in your skin, it does, it's killed. But if it's fortunate enough in a, in a naive host to penetrate your skin and to transform in the skin to the next stage, which then goes to your lungs. Your immune system could kill it mm -hmm. if you had primed it against those two stages. But since this is a primary infection, your immune system can't detect it yet. It's still running after it, so to speak. It's shedding right. antigens. It gets to your lung fields. It's there for a couple of days, maybe a week at most. We're, we're very unsure about this because this is a human infection, so you can't do those experiments. So all of the experiments that we know about for the life cycles have been done in other animals. So in monkeys, they behave right. similarly. Once they escape from the lung fields and migrate to the liver, where they then grow up to adults and they secrete hormones which attract each other, they mate, they crawl via the uh, portal circulation out of the liver, Mm -hmm. into the mesenteric venules. Once they're there, the immune system does not recognize it as being foreign. Okay. That's the mystery of this. There. For Many 20 years. years. 20 years. It doesn't kill you? The worms themselves don't kill you, but the eggs that they secrete can cause huge amounts of pathology, uh, depending on how many adults there are. Yeah. Okay, And each adult worm pair per species, produces different numbers of eggs. So it's very complicated stuff. We, we talked about this a lot, right? We sure did. So, yeah. But the point that we didn't talk about mm -hmm. was what mechanism is the parasite using to cloak itself from the right. immune response, right? So there's, there's, been, a, know? there's been a burst of activity uh, in that realm. So from, let's say, the year 2000 mm -hmm. until now, there have been a number of seminal papers that have established certain proteins that are intrinsic to the tegument, which is the outer layer. The, if you looked at the ultrastructure of this worm through the eyes of an electron microscopist, mm. you would be confounded with all of the structures that this worm presents to you. It has a, a, a glycocalyx-like affair on the outside of the worm, followed by a tegumental layer of cells, followed by a space, and then underneath that there are more cells of different kinds. It's a very complicated invertebrate. You don't have a picture in your book, do you? I do, but not in that sense. We didn't try to tell medical students how complicated these things are. We just wanted them to know how you to get rid of them. You want to them, right? Well, we didn't have time for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. The point is that the host supplies proteins for the parasite to include onto its surface to mask the molecules that could be attacked by your immune system. So in order to protect them, they cover them up with your molecules and prevent you from disturbing their little lives. So are you telling me that if you <coughs> took uh, uh, 
schistosomes from a mouse. Yeah. And it would be coated with mouse proteins, and you could detect that using antibodies. Correct. And that, that was the original set of experiments that led to the current papers that we'll be discussing. Okay. So I would like Joe, to review that. Yossi was going to ask a question. What were we going to say? Please, Yossi. Well, it's not just any protein, right? Those are specific proteins. Right. right? Are there specific right. host proteins? Yes. That are really? Right. Okay. That's right. There are semi-selective, I think, maybe. Perhaps. Ah. Perhaps. And what are they binding to? Ah, that's the question. And that's, the, that's what this, these two papers are all about. To try to find out the target that binds the host proteins. What uh, is the host protein? Do you know? Well, we have some of them. Yeah, some <laughs> candidates. It's a, still a million-dollar question, I guess. Oh, it's some, so why don't they just take the, the parasites and do total proteomics on them, right? Well, they actually did. There are, there are some data in, in that level. The, 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 in non-immune IgG, of IgG1 and IgG4, for instance, has been found on the surface of the world. Non-immune? <clears throat> non-immune. You mean not specific for the epitope it's That's hitting. correct. So, so they're uh, binding them by their FC fragments. FC? Yeah. Not so by is the there an FC receptor on the surface Apparently of these? Apparently there is. Apparently uh -huh. there is. So that's one set of molecules. But I know that other, other host proteins have also been found on the surface. And it, it also, the worm itself produces a beta-2 microglobulin-like molecule. And that so what does that do? It confuses the macrophage, so it can't start to process this as a difference. So it says, you must be the same. So it wanders off okay. seeking another target. Interesting. So here's the original set of experiments that led to all of this. And, and I actually knew this guy. His name was uh, Ron Smithers. He operated out of um, Mill Hill in London. But Roland Terry was a, com uh, was a, uh, um, a frequent um, collaborator, is what I was wanting to say. So I knew both Roland Terry and uh, Ron Smithers. And so... They found that if you could infect a mouse with, let's say, schistosoma mansoni, which you can do by exposing their tail to the saccharia in a water bath. Dip them into a cocktail <laughs> of schistosoma. You, you, you anesthetize the mouse, <laughs> yeah. you hang them over the edge of an aquarium in which you've got uh -huh. the snails shedding all these saccharia. How and long? <clears throat> it depends on how many saccharia you would like to have penetrate. So, you know... A, an Anywhere hour from a day. No, Give me no, a no, rough. No, no, no. An hour. All right. An hour. And then they're it, anesthetized this whole time? They are. They are. You can use Nebutol and stuff like this for that. And they don't wake up. Well, they might. So you can use them a little bit more, you know. Right. It's kind and of a fun infected. little nap. Is that the best way to do this through the tail? Well, the tail has a lot of uh, hair follicles on it. And and does yours? My tail has shrunk up to a little tiny little nubbin. <clears throat> and it's. It, it, Vince, that was not even a funny comment. You know, you're, I knew a guy. You're gonna have to edit this all thing. And when I was a postdoc, <laughs> we had an MD in the lab, and he had a kid who had a vestigial tail. Really? As a patient, yeah, it was like this long. What did he do with it? And I, it's about four inches long. As an amputee. I don't know what they did. I think maybe, but he was. It was very curious. Weird. Okay, so the original experiments in these guys' labs, what they wanted to do was just transfer parasites from host to host and see what happened. So nothing happened except that if you use an anti-mouse protein reagent, like an, you immunize monkeys against mouse serum, which you can do, you can make monkey anti-mouse proteins, you take those antibodies from the monkey mm -hmm. and uh, look at the surface of schistosomes from mice, right. and you will find many of those proteins stuck to the surface of the worm. Sure. This is an interesting finding. They said, gee, uh, look at this. This is half parasite, half mouse. So I wonder if it happens in the rat. So they tried it in the rat, and sure, sure enough, they used monkey immunized against rat serum, hmm. and they found a difference between the mouse and the rat, pra parasites. <clears throat> and then they said, I wonder what would happen if I took mouse-infected schistosomes, or in mice infected with schistosomes, I should say, took those adults and moved them into the rat. I wonder what happens to the mouse proteins on their surface. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, after two or three days after the transfer of the parasites from the mouse to the rat, the entire surface of the parasite had switched over to the rat and sure. shed all the mouse proteins. Mm -hmm. Didn't keep any of them. But then they did <clears throat> the critical experiment that I know Yossi is dying to hear the results from. We've had this conversation already, but I'll repeat it. So the, the really interesting part of it is that uh, they, they came up with an explanation as to why this might be going on. 
Why what, the swap of proteins might be going Why on. they would take up host proteins to begin with. What good would that do the parasite, right? So they said, well, I wonder if these proteins are critical for the survival of the parasite. And to find out whether that's true or not, they did the following experiment. They took mouse serum and immunized normal rats against normal mouse. So now you have antibodies in the rat that can detect the difference between its own proteins and the mouse serum proteins. And you'd think that they would be pretty close, but there are some big differences in these animals. And so the antibodies that you would generate in the rat can identify a number of proteins. Then they did the experiment of taking the mouse schistosomes and transferring them into the rats, and what do you suppose happened? You just told us that the proteins get swapped for the rat proteins. Uh, 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 not in the rat that's been immunized against the mouse proteins. No, you didn't say that. You I just said that. No, you didn't say they infected that, that rat. You I should... just said that. I'll repeat right. it. You have a rat <laughs> immunized with mouse serum proteins? Yes. Just total serum. That's all. All right. A mouse that's never been infected with schistosomes. Yeah, you give that to a rat. You let it make an antibody response against serum proteins. Then you infect right. it with mouse a schistosome derived, from a mouse. Yes, and what do you suppose happens? So you said that the, the proteins don't shift to the rat. Is that what you said before? What I said was it takes about three days for the, for the schistosomes to shed their old coat of proteins. I would see that the, the rat antibodies are going to attack the, the mouse proteins on the schistosomes, right? And, and what do you suppose happened? Probably kill them. It did. Hmm? It did. That's and exactly if you took the correct. control, which was schistosomes from a different species, they probably would grow in the rat, but I bet they didn't do that control. No, I think they might have done that one. They or might have an, taken... Or a, a non-immunized rat. How about that? Right. It probably multiplied right. normally, right? Or they don't multiply, but they however many you put in will establish... So you way. count the number of schistosomes per animal. That's how the assay works. Sure, right? they'll, they'll take 10, an, 10 from this animal and put it into the rat, and then they can recover them afterwards. Okay. And they're easy to see. They're pretty big worms, actually. Where do you look for them? In the mesenteric venules. Okay. They live in the same place in those animals as they do in humans. So that's the original finding, is that there's something on the surface of the parasite that's being protected by host normal proteins that prevents immune attack and allows the worm to survive for long periods of time. And every one of these papers... Why do you, why do you say it prevents immune attack? From that experiment, you wouldn't conclude that. Well, the, the moment the parasite sheds the mouse proteins in an attempt to put the rat protein in place, apparently mm. it reveals the molecule holding on to the mouse protein. And as the antibody attacks the mouse protein... It also now can detect the presence of this um, worm protein that, I, that, that actually attaches the mouse protein to it. So they've revealed the epitope by shedding the mouse protein in an immune attacking rat. So it prevents, I think what it does is prevents the reestablishment of cloaking. Why, though? It doesn't make sense. Well, uh, ask the guys who did the experiments. Because as the, prote as the mouse protein falls off the schistosome, why doesn't the rat protein just jump on and prevent any immune attack, right? But, well, you, you could ask that question, but everybody... These are in rats that don't have previous immunity to schistosomes. That's that correct. Right? That is exactly correct. Mm. Well, it might just take time. And in fact, it of course take it takes two, time. Takes two weeks, and let's right? say the yeah. shedding takes also two days and one day to acquire. A couple of days, know. yeah. So in yeah, the meantime, so you can attack... Yeah, but you need two weeks to make antibodies, though. You right? do. No, but no. you have already antibodies against the mouse protein. And oh. if they tend to okay, so take these time till they are released from the schistosome, then why so not? So these are previously immune rats? Yes. Because I just asked you, you said no, but now you're changing your answer, right? So these are immunized rats, because then yep. you would immunize you see that. So rats that were immunized against yeah. <clears throat> okay. mouse serum proteins. If you don't have an antibody present, it would take two weeks to make it, and then there wouldn't be this uh, detection of the schistosome. Yeah, so what, I think you didn't answer Vince's question, and I think I didn't either. What Vince is saying is that even though you have antibodies in rats against mouse normal serum proteins, why does the rat end up killing the schistosome? Because it's still covered with mouse protein. And so if you attack that molecule, you also kill off the molecule holding on to it in the schistosome. Probably. Maybe. Maybe. Oh, so there, isn't a, there isn't a good explanation for the result other than the fact that the surface of the worm is not attackable under ordinary circumstances because it's covered 
over with something that prevents you from looking sure, at the epitopes. Sure. Okay. All right. Now let me just so, clarify one thing. Please do. You get infected, the cercaria go through your skin. True. And then they they morph into something. Just a somulo. That cannot be attacked by the immune system that, because it's going to be covered with host protein. No, no. It doesn't learn how to do that until it gets to the lungs. How long does that take? A couple of days. All right. So that's before you have an antibody attack. That's right. So there's no... And then when it gets to the lungs, it's going to coat itself. And then, then you can't make an antibody yeah, against it because it's yourself, essentially. That's correct. And so then for 20 years, these guys persist in you you because it. of that. You got it. So there's no way a vaccine can ever work unless you prevent... The initial infection of cercaria, right? Correct. Is that the right word? It is. And, and people have actually uh, looked into that and looked at the immunogens. And the immunogens are largely uh, secreted proteases right. and largely metalloproteases. So there's a guy by the name of Jim McCarrow out at UCSF that has uh, actually made his living studying metalloproteases secreted mm-hmm. by parasites and in particular schistosomes. So you can make a good immunogen against that. And you can, in fact, in, in endemic areas, where little kids are exposed again and again and again every year to the same yeah. kind of sicariae. <clears throat> if you look in adult populations, you can find these skin reactions every time they enter the water. Mm-hmm. And if you look inside the skin, you can see eosinophils and IgE antibodies surrounding these penetrated schistosomula, and they're all killed. So that's the, the, uh, the acquired mechanism in an endemic area. Ain't against your adult worms. It's against the new penetrating stages that are trying to establish more and more and more infection. Yeah, you're already inf- These kids are all <laughs> infected already, though. Correct. Right? And they reach a certain level. Like when they get to be 15 or 16 or 17 years mm-hmm. old, they can't acquire any more infection. And by the time you're 30 to 35 years old, you're starting to lose your infection because the worms live for about 20 years and then they start to die. So that if you look at people that are lucky enough to survive in these horrible mm-hmm. conditions, 40, 45, 50 years old, almost none of them have active schistosome infection. And it's because they're protected against the penetrating stage coming in to begin with. All right. But it doesn't explain how to make a vaccine against the adult worms. When you might want to do that because you have a whole bunch of people that are already infected, all right? You want to eliminate the worms that are already in them. You do. So, And, and also keep in mind that these, at mm. least one of these infections infects animals. Mm-hmm. It infects uh, ox, okay, and water buffalo. And those are used in the Orient a lot, Asia, okay. uh, Japan, et cetera. So Not there's Japan, no current anymore. vaccine, right? There's no Nothing. current vaccine. But what they're really trying to find out is, what is the biology of this infection all about? It's a really interesting biological question, okay? Do people work on this? Lots of people are working on this. This gets a lot of funding. Oh, yeah? Yeah, this is not one of your great neglected diseases. This is not a neglected disease. <laughs> the two papers you picked are in neglected tropical diseases. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. No, one's in nature. The One one of them is, uh, is in nature. The papers you sent me. Understood. In which I read. And both that's good. In PLOS. That's neglected right. tropical diseases, young man. So I thought I would go back to the original nah, paper give me this, that that's spawned fine. the other two. <laughs> and this one is in nature. Tetraspanins on the surface of Schistosoma mansoni are protective antigens against schistosomiasis. This is 2006, so this predates the two papers that you sent. That's true. Okay. That's true. So the original finding of these uh, gentlemen from England were, it was quite startling to show first, and I know that uh, Yossi has some opinions about this, so I will just begin by saying that uh, if you wanted to characterize the exposed proteins on the surface of a schistosome, what you would do first is take the schistosome adults out of an animal and maintain them in vitro for a while because they will shed those proteins. Shed. They will shed in vitro, right? Of course they will. But wait, in vitro means in the absence of any cells in a, in a culture with some medium in it, right? That's correct. Is there serum in the medium? No. Yeah, it can't be, otherwise it'll pick up those proteins. Correct. All right, got it. So it's a serum-free, like medium-199 or something like this, or right. MEM. So <clears throat> the worms sit there for a while, and they shed their proteins that they've a- have attached to their own proteins. And then you could now ask the question, how many proteins in the surface of the worm, what kinds, are actually exposed and available for attaching to anything, all right? Okay. And they, they, what they did was they biotinylated. They used biotin, all right? And they did two 
methods for this because the complex structure is so complicated. It's not just a single layer. There are multiple layers mm -hmm. to this thing. So they, they did short pulse labeling and long-term labeling. What does biotinylating mean, Dixon? Well, you take biotin. What is biotin, Dixon? <laughs> Come on, Yossi, help me out here. <laughs> no, he's not going to help you. He thought he was going to help you. No, no, no. It's a, it's a molecule that you can then use a column to pull it out of solution. Uh, if it's attached to something else or if it's not attached to something what else. What will attach to biotin, Dixon? Oh, I'm blocking on this Do you know badly. Streptavidin. Okay, streptavidin. <laughs> they bind very tightly. Right? <clears throat> it does. So what you do first is... <laughs> I'm helping him? No, you're, you're embarrassing He's me in public. He's my co-host. <laughs> I used to know all this. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. That's true, you're I did. You're an emeritus. <laughs> um, so they, they, um, they did two biotinylation times... So by, by biotinylation, <coughs> you can attach chemically the biotin residue to another protein. That's you what can. they're doing to the That's right. And then they okay. want to identify which protein, so they solubilize the mass, the mixture, and then they isolate the whatever is attached to biotin right. on a strep abdomen column, and then they use free biotin to release it. It comes out, they concentrate it, they do a gel, and then they say how many proteins there are, okay? And how many do they get? There weren't that many. Really? About nine different proteins. That's yeah, all but, but only in this, it should be noted that there are, since then, discovered relatively quite a lot of tagumen outer proteins. Yeah. Oh, there's a ton of outer proteins, but there are... Um, schistosoma, mansoni, or... Uh, or japonicum. They yeah, did a, I think they're mixed. The list they is, did several different okay. species. A lot of enzymes, a lot of... Yeah. A lot of molecules. Okay. But the ones that they focused in on were these tetraspanin molecules, okay? They found two major tetraspanins. So we should back up a little bit. You can ask me what a tetraspanin, because I've done some reading. Well, I want to know how they, how they knew. First of all, you say they ran a gel and they saw lots of bands. They so did. How could they identify these proteins? Exactly. They, they, just, they, just, they just they did it by molecular weight first, yeah. and then they did uh, digestions. Cut them out of the gel, sequenced yeah, them? Yeah, sure. Or mass spec, and then they... Okay. And some, some of them sequences. were tetraspanins. What's you, a tetraspanin, Dixon? Thank you for asking, Vince. I <laughs> was waiting all the time. I was hoping, hoping you would ask me something, two weeks, right? <laughs> something I can answer, because I've been doing some outside reading, as they would say. Uh, tetraspanins are, are a large family of molecules that, that traverse the membrane four different times. So tetra is a four thing. One, two, three, four... The N terminus of the molecule and the C terminus of the molecule are intracellular. Okay. And by tetraspanning the, the membranes, it creates two loops of peptide. Right. The loop number one is a small loop, and the second loop is a large loop. Now, what do you mean by small and large? Well, <laughs> just by that, you make, it, make a loop with your fingers. How many amino acids? Uh, it varies. It varies, all right. Like uh, 10? No, 100 for the outside loop. The, the big bigger, one is 100? The bigger loop is about 100. The small one is less. Okay. Much less. And, and the interesting thing about the, uh, the larger loop is that they have these motifs called CAX boxes. CAX? C-X-X-C. Okay. The cysteine, two amino acids Correct. and another cysteine. And they can cross-link and make uh, disulfide bonds out okay. of this. And they form a pocket. The outer loop forms an actual pocket. Okay. And that pocket has functionality attached to it, all right? And, but hardly any of these tetraspanins are characterized in terms of their function. Hardly any of them. So when you it, say this pocket has functionality... But they suspect it has functionality. they suspect. <laughs> they do. <laughs> the, and they, it might relate to signal transduction reactions, or it could be like relating to viral attachment mechanisms. So what a lot of them are related to that. Something binds in the pocket, and then something happens in the cell. That's what you're thinking? Uh, that's what they're thinking. I, I just, I'm quoting from you're their literature. Relating. Okay. So from mammalian systems, there are about 30 different tetraspanins. And so you and I have tetraspanins. Humans have 29 of those 30 represented in, in our all genome. our cells. Apparently. Okay. Apparently. Is he okay on this, Yossi, so far? Yeah. More I or less. Think so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working and, on it. They're, they're big family, so. They're in huge. Those, in, probably <clears throat> not in all the cells, you have all of them, but. Yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. but in parasites, apparently, at least in schistosomes, there are less, there are fewer. How many and, did you say? Sorry. Well, the only ones I know about are the ones that they characterized. Two. Two. Okay. And. And they were both isolated, and then the amino acid sequence was determined, mm -hmm. and they constructed peptides based on their uh, outer loop, the larger of the two loops. They made <clears throat> peptides from that, 
and uh, then attempted to immunize using those peptides. Mice. Yeah, they were using mice in this case. Okay, with a peptide immunogen. That's right. Okay, is that what that paper, the Nature paper you showed me is based yes. on? Yes, yes they did. And what they found was that, um, and then they go ahead and challenge the mice. By dipping their tail? Yes. Got it. And the tetraspanin-1 molecule motifs did not protect very, effect- very effectively. So either loop or both loops? Or it was the outer, the larger the of big the two one. loops. But tetraspanin-2 mm-hmm. did. It reduced the infection by over 50% and reduced the egg production by over 70%. So what do that, you think? What's the mechanism of protection? Does it prevent the uh, cercaria from colonizing? No, no. That this this tetraspanins are not found on the cercaria. In fact, they're stage they're on specific. the adults. Yes. Ah, so the cercaria that they don't have them. They're on That's adults. Right. So, the, so the when worms you, can progress all the way to adulthood before they're affected by the. All right. Antibody. So at the adult stage, when they express it, then they're susceptible. That's what correct. What do the antibodies do? Do they prevent? The host proteins from attaching, or do they lice the schistosome in the presence of complement, or bring T cells? Or Keep talking. You don't Keep know. Talking. We well, don't know. the the immune mechanism that everybody adheres to this is no pun intended, of course, is the one in which <laughs> in which eosinophils and IgE are acting in concert with complement and other immune okay. effector molecules to punch holes in the surface of the yeah. worm. All right. And when that occurs, then the worm starts to die. Yeah. All right, that's nice. Yeah. So we. So this is a nature paper. So it must be right. Is that what we conclude? We. Yossi laughs. Yeah. We would never say that, but he trusts nature papers more than he does plus one papers. No, that's that's not true. <laughs> the plus one was really. Let's not talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> but what we want to talk about is the possibility of the fact that tetraspanin two molecules from Schistosoma mansoni may be one of the molecules that the parasite uses to bind host proteins with. Now, the reason why I'm even talking this way about this subject mm-hmm. is because I'm not as much interested in what the um, effector mechanisms are for immunity to schistosomes as I am in using the escape mechanism that this parasite has evolved into for other purposes. So by that, I mean, let's turn this sword, this parasite, let's just assume it's a uh, bad thing to have this parasite, we know it is. What if we could somehow take advantage of the fact that this parasite can camouflage itself from our immune system? Could we use their mechanism for peaceful uses of parasites, let's say? All right? So I'm calling that a plowshare concept. So what, we're, what we would like to know is if the interaction from parasite to host involves a protein-protein interaction to affect the camouflage mechanism that mm-hmm. we're talking about, all right, the, ma- the masking mechanism, then there's a gene for that protein in the parasite. The tetraspanin? <clears throat> yeah, if it turns out to be the tetraspanin, let's just hypothetically say it's the tetraspanin, but I know that Yossi and I would right. both admit that this is the beginning of studies, not the end so of the studies. So your hypothesis is that the tetraspanins are among the proteins that are binding host proteins? Sure. Or maybe supporting other proteins that binds. So thing. what happens if you delete the gene for the tetraspanin? Ah. What happens? What happened? They, they, they did that already. Did they do it? Yeah, they did. What happened, you'll see. I didn't like the paper, so maybe you should talk about it because I had um, no. I, I'm, I'm the bad reviewer, apparently. No, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna talk about it. You're gonna say what the result was, and then say why you don't. Um, it's not as reliable a result as you would like to see. So can, it, this can be done in schistosomes. You can delete genes. You can. You can transfect them. They're pretty easy, actually, because they no, they deleted they, the gene. Now, how many? No, no. They use an SRNA. They do transient. Oh, they they electroporated the entire organism. Right. Okay, with SRNA. Down. So it's also a bit, you know, controversial whether or not, because, you know, when you lyse the cell and then you look for the protein, you're mm-hmm. looking at a population, so maybe some were more receptive, that's, what, that's the word? Receptive, yeah. yes. To the SRNAs, maybe some other cell or not. You don't really know, so it's, yeah. it's problematic anyway, but right. the result was strange, no? Yes, so? it was strange. Because I don't think anything really happened at the end. Well, like, they... they couldn't demonstrate binding of immunoglobulin to the molecule any longer because it wasn't there. Yeah, because it wasn't there. 
the the molecule of interest had disappeared. Wait, 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 wait. And the target that they so, had raised this antibody against was no longer. I don't remember. Was it just Western blotting against the protein, yeah. or maybe they did? I don't. I think it was just Western blot, right? They lysed the entire organism, ran it on a gel, and came with an antibody against the. If I'm not mistaken, yes. so it's, it's a bit problematic to begin to say that there is no protein anymore in the animal. Yeah. And in, in one of the papers you sent, it says Please. that the knockdown says that the uh, tetraspanin two plays a role in formation of the tegument because the knockdown schistosomes have thinner outer membranes and they're different, right? Could be, but no one's been able to delete the gene <laughs> no. to see if it's essential. No, no, no one has and done that yet. Knockdown. Nobody yeah. has done that. Because if you yet. could do that, then you could infect mice and see are there post proteins still sticking to the But that might be a lethal deletion. <laughs> well if it's not, yes, if it's lethal you can't do the experiment. Right. But right, those right. those proteins are also they are GIP proteins. They have a long yeah. intercellular tail, so yeah. it might doing be doing something else if you delete them. But that was another way they looked for these proteins on the surface. They actually cleaved them at the GIP anchor. It was GPI anchor. Rather. GPI. And they Glyc got a, sorry, not a host. Glycophosphatylinositis. Yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. Uh, Paul England. Paul England. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Why are you thanking Paul? <laughs> because he was the, one of the first people to actually work on this. You know, there used to be a man here who worked on GPI-linked really? proteins. Yep. You know, you know who that was? Your Glycophosphatylinositol. <laughs> Correct. All right. Multiple links of various molecules. Very, very but interesting these, stuff. But um, these schistosome <coughs> tetraspanins have transmembrane sequences. They do. All right. They do. So knockdown has some effect on morphology, but... And binding to the immune serum that was directed against the molecule to begin with to right. prove so that it wasn't there. So that's why you guys have a little problem with the result in that the it's not yeah, the, clear if the, the assay protein is was gone. Correct. So they stained them. They did immunofluorescence, right, to see if the yeah. protein was present. Yeah. Was there still some left, or was it gone? Or? Was it immunofluorescence or Western uh, blotting? I don't I, remember. No, I think they did immunofluorescence also. <laughs> the point of the of the investigation was that they didn't do the critical experiment, which to infect? was infect, yeah, and see what bound or yeah, didn't that's, bound. Right. Yeah. that's exactly right. Well, that's too bad. It was too bad. Well, maybe they're working on it now, or maybe there were some technical problems encountered, mm -hmm. so that you couldn't go to the next stage. The point is that we're, I think we're much closer now to defining the mechanism by which this parasite cloaks itself from the immune response than we were, let's say, five years ago, where we didn't have a clue. All right, so because we know some of the proteins that are on the surface right. now. But it's not likely that tetraspanins are the only ones binding host proteins, right? We don't know that. Has anyone taken the peptide and see if it binds any other protein? That, that's another good experiment. No one's done that. I mean, Maybe it's hard because you don't know if the confirmation is right. Exactly. But it's exactly. hard with these multiple. Because if you just had a simple transmembrane with one extracellular... Like toll-like receptors <laughs> or things like that. You could cut it off and see if it binds <laughs> because it would probably fold properly in the absence of the membrane. But this tetraspanin... This is tough. This is tough. Ass. So um, we tough. don't really know if the tetraspanins bind any host protein. We don't, but we do I'm sorry, know. That's not, you said they did a biotinylation. They did. Well, that was with total surface proteins. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Has anyone expressed the tetraspanin and then see if they could pull down host proteins? Not a good, not a good not question. Done. Not a good question. All right. But it raises the um, possibility, <clears throat> or at least it reveals the possibility, of, of exploring this further in rigorous scientific fashion. So this interests you, right? Very much so, because I, I would love to be able to say at some point, <clears throat> this is the mechanism or mechanisms. Yeah by which the parasite attaches host proteins to it and escapes from your immune response. Because wouldn't you like to be able to teach a, a pig heart to do the same thing? How we, would, could you use that knowledge to make a vaccine? Oh, but of course. But of course you could, and that's, that's what this is. This is called... Well, I have another paper for you, Vince. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I do, because despite... Apparently different from the ones he sent me earlier. <laughs> Apparently, because while I was... You know, <laughs> I, I was stimulated to go read more, actually. So what what they found in this paper was they got a modicum of protection. Of protection but we don't using know the mechanism, but we, we got don't some know. protection. They weren't okay. worried about the mechanism. They didn't want to know what molecules yeah, yeah, were important. Course. But in what they did in this paper, mm -hmm. which is the next paper, and then PLOS One, 
great neglected diseases. Plus neglected <laughs> tropical diseases. And it, it's, okay. it's no wonder it's in there because Peter Hotez is the editor-in-chief. Uh, and Peter Hotez works on hookworm infection. So what Peter did was right, he... This is the paper you sent me, <clears throat> one of the two. Thank that's you. right. So, so what he did was... I read that one. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what this group did was combine forces and make a chimeric antigen yes. of tetraspanin from the parasite of schistosomes and the, uh, uh, the ASP1 protein from the secretions of the adult hookworm. ASP? Yes. And I'll you can't, look up you to can't see what tell that's... our listeners ASP. <laughs> <laughs> it's a protease. <laughs> Aspartic? Yeah. Protease? That's right. I would, I would guess. That's right. Yeah, hookworm aspartic protease, That's ASP. Right. That's Actually, right. It's AS, APR. APR, okay. The point is that... Uh, <laughs> they fused the sequences together. They what did. do they do? They want to get two vaccines together? Oh, but of course. Of bigger, course. Bigger bang for your buck? Sure, and the schistosomiasis problem in China hasn't gone away because there's a reservoir host in the, in the way that they yeah. use, plow their fields. Right? They do use, the same people get schisto and hookworm? They do, they do, they do. That's the other point. Okay. So if we had a vaccine for one, why not make it two? Now this aspartic protease. <laughs> yes. Do people know? Did people know before this that it would be protective if you made antibodies against it? We did. Peter knew this, and he has this. He has clinical trials going on now. Oh, with just a vaccine for the aspartic protease. Correct. What's the function of this as aspartic protease? Um. I believe it allows the larva to go through the tissues. Okay. That's my impression. So you're uh, making antibodies too, or you're going to block that so that's they can't right. infect? That's right. correct. That is correct. He's so, got other um, vaccine candidates that relate to coagulation, so they, anticoagulation. So they express a protein with tetraspanin 2, part of it, one of the yep. loops, and yep. this aspartic protease. Yep. They immunize mice. Yep. And what happens? They get a higher level of protection against the TSP. Then with TSP two alone, right, right, which exactly is the, right. The first paper you had sent, so it's almost didn't like an all, adjuvant. Really. Almost like, well, it worked just at the minimum level that WHO defines as you've got a vaccine candidate. Continue uh, to work on it because you know the title of that paper is. is <laughs> yes, I do. I sent it to you. Enhanced <laughs> protective. Inconsistent. Well, this is enhanced. Oh, there's the, another paper here. Yeah, this is the first PLOS uh, ne neglect yeah, neglected yeah, diseases yeah, from yeah. 2011. There are variants. Where they the use tetraspanin 2 alone, but they said inconsistent protective e efficacy. That's true. And so by adding this hookworm sequence, it gets better. It does get better. Now, you mentioned a word that they never mention in the paper, and you said adjuvant. I was thinking of that word, and they, yes. they're trying to see if there's some cross-reactivity between the hookworm and the system. No, it's probably an adjuvant. <laughs> That's what I think it is. What does an adjuvant do, Dixon? It holds the antigen in the, in the tissue long enough for the host immune responses to develop yeah. fully. It's what some of them, some of them cause inflammation, so they you do? get better adaptive responses. That's right, like Freund's adjuvant, for yeah. instance. So maybe that's what it's doing. I, maybe that is what it's doing. Because I'd be really surprised if a peptide on its own... Had similarities to... No, nah, I don't think so. Had, or it would Especially be very... You know, peptide vaccines in general aren't, aren't very good because they no, don't... they're not. First, they don't replicate, and then right. they don't stimulate inflammation, which is what you need to get a good immune response. So a way around that is to give a DNA vaccine for the no, same peptides. No, they don't stimulate inflammation. That's why they haven't worked very well. Oh, okay. They don't stimulate inflammation. Well, at least you get continuous production. You know what we did on TWIV yesterday? I don't. An mRNA vaccine. Did you? Against influenza. It encodes the protective antigen, plus the RNA stimulates the innate response. I'll be doing It's a TLR antigen, and that ha. induces inflammation. They get a ha. good... It's very immunogenic. Nice. Very nice. So that's... Uh, probably what that hookworm protein is doing. So are you excited about that? I'm, ex I'm pleased that they've entered the molecular world of vaccinology because before this we were shooting in the dark, basically. But, but uh, Dixon, you know, it's only like a 50% reduction in the number of I know, I know. worms, right? Yeah. It's not great. You really want to have better. Of course you do. And so this is only a start. It's only a They're start. They're not going to put this in people, right? No, but they might put it into the animals, they may put it into the water buffalo, for instance, and immunize them against this. Yeah, by 50%, is, is that enough? Of course not. Although it may reduce the burden of worms, and therefore... Yeah. Uh, should I, can I call him a worm? Sure. 
The airworms. The airworms. Yep. Does it work on, on worms that are already protected you, the big and problem. covered with your serum? Mm. <laughs> well, <clears throat> probably not. Right? The biggest problem with working with these parasites is that they're multicellular and they're very complicated in their biologies. So to have success at that level is asking a lot. If you look at viruses, for instance, and even, I mean, I bet you can't explain to me, Vince, fully. <laughs> I can't explain anything. <laughs> or <to you>. <laughs> even partially <laughs> why the yellow fever vaccine works so well. It's the gold standard for almost all the other virus vaccines, right? It's a live attenuated vaccine. And it's, it's one of the first ever found, and it's still better than all the others put together, as far as I was led yeah. to believe. What I could tell you is that it mimics a normal infection, and that's why, but we don't know what about right. that. Yeah. We don't. We don't. The polio vaccine is very good also, the same it's way excellent. as the infectious vaccine. But you couldn't do that with these parasites because you'll damage the host in trying to infect them. Wait, wait a minute. What did you say? What if you were to produce... Oh, an infectious uh, sterile, Yeah, sterile just Could you do that? Sure. Would you like to have worms living in your no, mesenteric no, no, no. venules? What if you irradiate schistosome so they're dead and then inject them? Does that give you protection? No, irradiating them doesn't make them dead, but it prevents them from developing, and that's where the data came from for the Sicaria vaccine. Isn't that what they tried with malaria? You bet, and it works perfect. It's just very difficult to get enough... Uh, Irradiated in that case, sporozoites. Yeah, wow, you've come a long way, Vince. I think I don't listen to you, <laughs> um, but you can't uh, probably either get enough irradiated uh, schistosomes, too, right? Well, they can get tons of sicaria and they can irradiate them, and they're they are still alive, but they don't complete the life cycle, and they'll stay in your skin. And then when they do that, they'll stimulate lots of immunity. So, if you say, well, maybe we can make an attenuated live schistosome vaccine using Sicariae. Mm -hmm. Do you know how difficult it is to maintain this life cycle? <laughs> but you, you know, said you don't want it's them very living, difficult. you don't want them living in you, do you? Well they would die. They would get trapped in the skin and they would be killed in the because skin. Because the the infectious viral vaccines, as you know, they get cleared. I do know this. Right. Oh these things will be good they'll resolve into a granuloma. You won't even be able to find the parasite afterwards. Mm -hmm. So it is anyone works. working on that kind no, of thing? No, that's these were older studies done yeah. by some people in Iowa and uh, some other investigators. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. I know, Iowa's a little uh, Yossi. I know you're from Israel. Uh, this is a state right in the middle of the country, <laughs> famous for its corn and pigs. Uh, but there were there was a couple there. Well, you don't know where Iowa is? Is that the problem? <laughs> I, I was surprised he looked at me like, "Is it true or not?" Because no, I have no clue. <laughs> No, the, they were they were quite a famous couple that worked on this uh, infection in monkeys. In fact, mm -hmm. and uh, they they used irradiated sicaria to show that you could induce a protection against the infection. Okay, that was number one. That was way back in the 1960s, mm -hmm. and uh, since then, of course, we've learned much more about it. And so, look at us now. I'm saying that we're probably at the stage that virology was at when uh, the first vaccines were being developed. When was that, Dixon? Oh, well, a long time ago, Vince. <laughs> How many different genome types? Well, the first one I know about was rabies, and that was with uh, Louis Pasteur. Right. <clears throat> but uh, we're not quite back that far. They make a statement here, which is very interesting. Please. The, there is a paucity of funding oh. driven by the no lack question. of a commercially viable market available for the production of vaccines against neglected tropical diseases. Oh, that's, that's, so a vaccine antigen must be amenable to low-cost manufacture. Right. Yeah, but it, nothing is cheap, okay? 250, is cheap. 250 million people infected with Can't this. Can't we help? Can't we, like, give the money to do this? To who? Well, why <laughs> I mean, this work is done in... At, uh, in the U.S., right? George Washington University, Houston, Baylor College in Houston. We're paying for the research. What they're saying is there's no money to make the vaccine once you test it. But right. why can't we help and give it away? We have enough money. We do. We make do. the world healthy. It's a better place. That's right. Then they, then they can all innovate, right? That's correct. <laughs> well, or at least attempt to innovate. There's You've said many times on TWIP yes. that... People who have these parasite infections cannot have productive lives. This is true. And if we can get them healthy, they can contribute to 
our sure right our planetary expansion that's peter hotez's main theme right that's we had him on the show we did too. we did right. we can have him again if we'd like but uh i think it's a common complaint everybody who does biomedical research complains that there's not enough money but but in particular these uh parasites that are very high on the radar screen of pathology and disease are very low on the horizon in terms of funding don't you think if Peter Hotez and colleagues developed a schistosome vaccine that was very effective in mice, don't you think the Gates Foundation would help to get that into they the people would. who needed it? They would help. But it's too early now. That's true. So I don't think they should say there's a paucity of funding. I well, think the you Gates, can find it. If the, you... the Gates helped Peter and his group with the hookworm vaccine. Is that being used in people? I told you he's in clinical trials in China. Yeah, okay. it's, it's Trials. being used. Okay. We don't know what the effect is. We don't right. know what the reduction effect is. Okay. But a malaria vaccine, on the other hand, uh, if you reduce the malaria infection by 50%, that would be doing a good thing. The children wouldn't die from malaria at that point. Right, right. So, okay. You know, so this, I merely wanted to bring our listeners up to date with regards to what I would consider to be a very difficult and intractable situation of having to work in animal models with animal immune systems and relate that to human infections. that It's just a disconnect. And it, it, I don't know how you're going to make that connection unless you start working with humanized mice. And I haven't seen any of those studies yet. But that's what you'd have to do next in order to avoid the ethicality of trying to just, okay, we've got a vaccine, let's go try it in people. Oh, you could... Couldn't try to do a it. couple of animals first. You could put it in primates, for example. You could. Show that it was safe and efficacious. And yes. then you do a phase one in people. You do a safety first. Yeah. Yeah. But you have to have a strong candidate. I don't think this is strong is enough. Strong. 50% reduction isn't enough. I would agree. You know, Because clinical trials are expensive. Subsequent animal work, you need to do another animal. It's what would be another too. worry here? Another worry? Yeah, the worry that I would have if we've got 29 different trans trend, uh, tetraspanins, one of them might cross-react with this, and then we'd be affecting yeah, our own biology. I saw a paper, a biophormatic paper, actually tested the diversity of the big loop. Yeah. And they're quite different, I think, yeah. from most tetraspanins. Which Maybe this is actually a good... That's a good thing. Yeah. Which good suggests thing. that the functionality of the tetraspanin is related to this part of the molecule. The other, I mean, one thing that they did mention is that there is, uh, there are many, there's a lot of variation in these tetraspanins. Lots. So is it possible that the parasite would make a slightly different tetraspanin in response to an immune pressure? Oh. Sort of like the trypanosomes? There's, there's, the trypanosomes can produce millions of offspring in a matter of days. Yeah. But this parasite, one adult? One parasite. It doesn't reproduce once it's Darwin. inside you. Not a good Darwin. Not a good Darwinian okay. model for this one, I'm okay. afraid. Got you. Yeah. I think this is an interesting story. So good, good. The tetraspanin yep. is cool. Yep. The um, identification of cell proteins binding to... So there's a lot of work to do here. Lots of work and to do. I don't do. think we covered this before, so that's pretty interesting. But I bet you that since we're being listened to by a wide variety of people out there. There's some... no one listening. <laughs> no, the CIA is listening for sure. That, that we might hear from some of our readers that they know no, they're some readers. things. They're listeners. And listeners, we have a website, Vince. They oh, go sorry, to the Dixon. website <laughs> and they look at that. They read it. I know they do okay. because we put the whole papers up on that website, right? What do you, what do you want them to do? <clears throat> I want them to respond to this by, by telling us whether they know something more about the um, you're the expert you're the world's expert no 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 i'm, I'm not I'm just without the, peer i'm just the mouthpiece for the yeah. <laughs> for the program but i'm certainly not a good mouthpiece though. not an expert why um, do you have manitoba on your shirt yossi oh you went there no just bought a shirt you just bought a shirt <laughs> you know where that is hey. it's canada man i'm a year here <laughs> that's all this is your first year in the u.s uh, actually, I started my second, but yes, like yeah. a year and a few months. So, Yossi, why don't you tell them why we are talking about this, you and I? So, we are interested in... I'm not sure it's going to be tetraspanin at the end. <laughs> I'm still skeptical. Sure. It's it's not guilty, 
yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But um, yeah, we're thinking to collaborate about it. Yeah. trying to find out the mechanism of this cloaking device. And schistosomes? Yeah. Yeah, you're going to grow schistosomes in the golf lab? You don't need to. Uh, we don't need to. Actually, I don't want to use the schistosome. You know? yeah. I just want to move the entire system to a mammalian oh. system. So express because the tetraspanin or some other Tetraspanin or maybe other molecules or maybe a combination of some molecules just to see if they really can cloak, let's say, cells. So mm -hmm. one of the first notions we thought of is actually taking, let's say, maybe a tumor from rat right. make it coat with uh, I don't know tetraspanin water molecules yeah, cool. and try to put it let's say in a mouse or in, in a rabbit or whatever and see if it yeah. can be protected it's a good idea why don't you coat a virus with it and then you can't neutralize the virus <laughs> it'll send the NSA BB after you oh not after me Vince you're, you're the virologist yeah, but you're one. doing the experiments <laughs> that's a good idea so you might do these experiments in the lab, right? Yeah, we've been talking about it. We're still thinking about it, about it yeah. 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 I notice you guys talk a lot. Is that we what, do. We so do. you started talking about science, right? We did. Okay. Finally. <laughs> How do you like the U.S.? It's great. Are you going to stay here or are you going to go back? No, I'm going to go back. In the future, yeah? Yeah. You have family there? Uh, my family is here. I mean, my close family You're is close, here. But my, yeah, I have family. still family there. My wife has family there, so yeah. Okay. Well, that's cool. Hope it works, Dixon. I do. Stay tuned. When you get your nature paper, we can talk about it. On <laughs> He's aiming for the Nobel for uh, <laughs> transplanting uh, pig. Uh. <laughs> stop, stop, stop. You want stop. a Nobel Prize? No. No, Vince. You never know. You could still get it. No. You want to do some email? Sure. You want to stick around for some email? There's just a few. 20, 30. No, there are three. <laughs> First one is from Ruth. She writes it to you. Dear Dick de Pommier. I don't want to... Me, you know. Vince, My name is Ruth. Vince. I'm a listener of TWIP, and recently I decided to look into your vertical farming that you mention on the podcast uh -oh. <laughs> now and then. While I was watching a video of you explaining vertical farming, you mentioned soilless growth in an urban environment. And I immediately thought of another video that I saw earlier this week. It's by a man, or about a man named Eric Mondu, M A U N D U, who combined aquaponics with fish farming in an amazing way. Using a very small amount of space, he set up a system with a fish tank. The fish water with the fish waste is carried on a basin of rocks which, in which sits plants. Bacteria break down the fish waste, and the plants use the nutrients. Afterwards, the water minus the waste is returned to the fish tank. Man Mondu also mentions that the fish could be edible types, so you could grow two, two resources at once. I Correct. just thought it was so amazingly efficient and thought you might be interested. So she sends a video. Well, thank you. Uh, there's a... A vertical farm in Chicago called The Plant, yes. which already makes use of this closed-loop agriculture. Mm -hmm. They have uh, tilapia and uh, other plants that they grow with the fish waste. So it's closed-loop, and the only thing that leaves are fillets of tilapia and uh, <laughs> microgreens for the salads that you're going to eat along hungry. with it. Did you have <laughs> your lunch yet? I did. I didn't. <clears throat> also, I would like to thank you and Vincent very much for this week in parasitism. And this week in virology, both wonderful entertainment and education. Yours, Ruth. Thank you, Ruth. Do you have to thank someone? I just did. Okay. That's not what I meant, but ah. it'll come to you. Next one is from Maureen. You listening? I am, yes. I'd like to learn more about sarcocystis, a parasite that usually uh, only affects animals, but seems to have infected some of our military. And she sends a paper. An outbreak of eosinophilic myositis attributed to human sarcosystis parasitism. Uh, this is uh, published in 1999, American Journal of Tropical Med Medicine and Hygiene, respected journal. Yes. Uh, seven members of a 15-man U.S. military team that operated in rural Malaysia developed an acute illness, which turned out to be sarcosystis. Tissue parasitism, parasitism by sarco. What is sarcosystis? It's a protozoan infection. It's an intracellular protozoan infection. Where do we get it from? Ah, that's a very good question. Somewhere in the environment, You right? can get it from eating raw meat that has the cysts inside, uh -huh. and then that starts the infection. It's, it's a very similar infection to all of the other apicomplexa. Uh, so what would be similar to what we've discussed? Give us an crypto, example. Crypto, crypto. Cryptosporidium? Yes, except that this insinuates itself throughout the muscle tissue. All right, and you can actually see it in large nests of these um, protozoans that are um, infecting muscle cells. Mm -hmm. 
It's very rare in people, isn't it? It is. I'm searching PubMed now. We see if we get anything. Pigs. Pigs. Lots of pigs. Mostly animals. Yep. Here's a 2012 paper. Outbreak of acute muscular sarcosis-like infection in returning travelers from Malaysia. Malaysia. What so else that comes was the from other paper? Too. What else comes from Malaysia, Vince? Nipah virus. Okay. That's a pig outbreak infection too. So this is in a something that happens uh, rarely. And how does it? What does it do to you? Well, it's funny you should mention that because ordinarily it doesn't do anything. I mean, you can look at these muscle sections from pigs, and there's no reaction against the parasite. Mm-hmm. There's nothing. So if they're saying this is an eosinophilic myositis, then humans, not being a normal host, maybe react to it, and then you start developing symptoms accordingly. Fever, myalgias, <laughs> bronchospasm, fleeting pruritic rash, Aha. transient lymphadenopathy, and subcutaneous nodules associated with eosinophilia. Dear, dear. So that's the symptom. It's not, it's not fatal, but no. it's... Uh, annoying. Annoying. And this right. one, one of the patients... Well, albendazole ameliorated symptoms. Huh. One individual, he had symptoms for more than five years. Wow. So uh, here it's it's an isolated outbreak, but if it's rare, then... But it looks like any time there is an outbreak, it's from Malaysia. <laughs> well, those are the ones I found. Um, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, Malaysia, Malaysia. Mm, what else? Iran. I mean, are you telling me you get malaise from Malaysia? <laughs> Common blackbird, sarcosystis in the common blackbird. Right. So this is not a, this is a minor parasite, right? Correct. That's why we didn't talk about it. Correct. Anything else you should know? No, but thank you for your comments. All right. Carl writes, to this week in parasitology podcast, Vincent Racaniello, Dixon de Pommier. Here's evidence-based advice for cat owners unwilling to get rid of their pets. Ah, Cat litter should be changed daily, and pregnant women should delegate this task to others. Many scoopable cat litter manufacturers suggest scooping fecal lumps daily and changing litter weekly, but this is likely to give a false sense of security because the oocysts might sporulate in the leftover feces. In addition, the scooping spoon is likely to become contaminated with oocysts. Hundreds may be present in a milligram of infected feces. There is also the risk of cats tracking infected feces throughout the house. We currently do not have a practical recommendation for safe disposal of cat litter other than disposing it in a heavy-duty plastic bag with the hope that anoxia will kill the oocysts. Uh, that's from Doobie et al., Survival of Tigande in Cat Litter, Journal of Parasitology. He's a good investigator. I trust Another him. one. Gloves should be worn while gardening, while changing litter, and while handling soil potentially contaminated with cat feces. Owners may also be advised to keep dogs away from the cat litter box. Vegetables should be washed thoroughly before eating. That's also Doobie. Another one. Practical suggestions. Here's what I'm doing with my three cats that my wife insists on keeping. I think this is uh, our... Carl here writing this. Yes. Using a small open litter box, arrange a big plastic bag covering the bottom and extending over the sides. Add the litter. At least once every 24 hours, wearing gloves, lift the bag, not the top, and throw it away. No scooping. Right. Then you have to have a new tray every time, right? You do. You do. We switch to pine pellets for litter, which is much cheaper, especially from farm or horse supply stores. (laughs) Uh, and finally, public health risk. Although most vets believe that cats should shed oocysts once for a few days, the leading researcher says whether naturally infected cats shed oocysts for more than once in their life is unknown. Right. It's also doobie. While everyone was skeptical of the initial reports of brain cysts leading to mental illness and car crashes, the more recent research has made such claims more plausible. Given the limits of research tools and funding and how small oocysts are and how hard it is to evaluate brain cysts, it seems prudent to minimize our individual risk of toxo from cats and encourage more effective public health efforts like changing the labels on cat litter. Got the right on the litter, on the, on the bag of cat litter. Caution may contain toxo oocytes. I assume you've been trying to get J.P. Doobie on your podcast. Please keep trying. Oh. Is he around? Sure. He's in uh, Beltsville. Beltsville, Maryland? Yes, as I recall. That's think where he lives. I think he'd like to uh, he might. join us. He might. All right. Uh, that 
brings us to the end of another twip. Probably the end until next year, Dixon. I am afraid so. Because you're going away, right? I am going away. You can find twip on iTunes and at microworld.org slash twip. We love to get your questions and comments. Send them to twip at twiv.tv. Dixon de Pommier can be found at all places all over the web. <laughs> but relevant to this show is trichinella.org and medicalecology.com and actually verticalfarm.com. Yep. Right? Thank you for doing this today, Dixon. You're welcome, Vince. Um, so you're going away yes. in a week yes. for a month. That's correct. You're going to New Zealand. I am. <laughs> the suffering. There's something wrong with that. <laughs> well, you can't do a twip for a month. <clears throat> I, no, I can't do a twip That's for a month. That's bad. Because you it have is. people oh. who depend on you. I will be very sad. you don't care. I do so care. All what right, makes well, you, you say come, I don't care? Because you're going away for a month. I wouldn't go away for a month. Vince. I would stick with my listeners. <laughs> but we're different people. It's okay. When you come back, we'll resume. We will. And people will be clamoring for you. In fact, they may come up to you in New Zealand and say, could we... That would be great. No, I would love that. Yossi Sabo, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's fun. I hope you uh, get great virology results and come back on TWIV. And maybe you get good schistosome. Who knows? We don't know. Really out-of-the-box project. If you don't try, you won't find it. Out-of-the-box. Is he good to talk to about out-of-the-box stuff? Sorry? Is he good to talk to about out-of-the-box stuff? He's good to talk to with a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff, yeah. yeah. That's why we have these podcasts, because he's a good talker. Yeah. A raconteur without peer. <laughs> what are you going to do in New Zealand? Are you going to chase hobbits? No, that's in the North Island. We're not doing the hobbit tour. We're going into the South Island, uh -huh. and we'll be camping and hiking, and uh, I'll be fishing. You're not working. You're not doing a vertical farm thing. No. This is all fun. Actually, the, I, there is a guy in... Um, the Canterbury section of the South Island. I'll have to email him to find out exactly where he wants me to give a talk on this uh, vertical farm. Oh, cool. So I might do it. Have fun. Yep. Thank you. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back in about a month. Another twip is parasitic. parasitic.